Welcome and thank you for joining today's AWRI webinar. My name is Robin Dixon. I'm a Senior Viticulturist for the AWRI. I'm joining you today from Ghana country and in the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people today. So in this session, we, we will look at non-chemical weed control. So while we give um, the few other people that are joining a, a chance to log on, uh, there's a few reminders about the session today. So um, we, the um, session is being recorded and we will send you a link to the recording on our YouTube channel after the webinar. Also, um, we ask you to um, provide your questions um, in the Q&A section of, uh, of the Zoom toolbar. So just go into the Zoom toolbar. You can enter your questions at any time throughout the webinar and we will answer them at the end of the session. So for anyone who's just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is non-chemical weed control. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Chris Penfold from the AWRI and Dr. Thomas Lyons from the University of Adelaide to our webinar today. Perfect, thank you. Now, is that working? Yes, that looks fabulous. Excellent. Well, greetings all. Thank you for, for so many of you um, tuning in to today's webinar series and uh, thanks for the introduction Robin. So yes today uh, non-chemical weed control seems to be a fairly pertinent topic at the moment. If we um, have a bit of a, a look around what's happening in particularly in, in Europe where uh, glyphosate is uh, certainly on the, on the nose it seems it's under review at the moment. Uh, December 22 they'll be deciding whether its uh, continued use is going to be permitted. So um, I guess that is, is something which we need to be aware of because, uh, you know, if they were to, to ban its use over there, well, what's going to happen to imported wine and, and so on. So um, there, there's certainly a, a fair amount of interest out there as to looking to alternatives in Europe. Those alternatives seem to mostly be based around tillage, um, but we believe that there's, there's probably better ways of doing it. I mean... Um, uh, I'm having a little bit of issue here as well. Um, oh, here we go. You've got to use a different method. So uh, hopefully you're still all in there. So yes, as this picture shows, taken about 20 years ago, but yes, we can achieve non-chemical weed control without um, by using tillage. In this case, a photo taken in the Barossa, where tillage was certainly the um, commonly used and overused. Um, rotary hose were the main form of uh, incorporating whatever cover there might have been on the soil surface, and the the um, the soil was uh, badly abused in the process until the stage where it became an erosion problem for both wind and water, and uh, and certainly not producing the best of uh, quality wine as well. So we like to think that we've moved on a fair way since then in our practices in the, the vineyards to something like this, which is much more commonly seen these days, a mid row where we're just using regenerated plants, in this case, mostly barley grass with a marshmallow there to be seen as well. And that'll get one or two mowings a year, pretty low input. Um, not, um, I mean, there's, I think there's probably better ways to, to do that as far as what cover crops might be growing there instead of regenerated swords, but that, that's a very cheap option. But as we see that undervine area has been sprayed out and it's probably going to get you know, three or four herbicide applications a year to maintain that clean uh, zone where there's uh, no competition for the vines. But if we are to be producing these wonderful wines, which we are so proud of in this country, um, it's interesting that we're using some of the worst management practices for the soil and under, those, under the vines. And to the extent where we often see moss growing and so on there, yeah, which is not a good, good sign for um, how we want to be, be utilising the soil in that, that zone. So 
um, we've done with um, funding from Wine Australia an amount of work over the years to, to have a look at how we might manage that better, which we'll uh, have a look at soon. But in the meantime, uh, there's lots of tools that have been developed over the years for trying to, to use non-chemical practices in that undervine zone. As we see here, a dodge plough followed by um, a, uh, a rotary hoe just running along that, that zone where the, the, the plough is thrown out the lumps into the, the mid-row, just to the, the uh, rotary hoe just breaking down those lumps so the tractor drivers can stay in their seats on the next pass. Um, the torn sole, which came out 20 odd years ago, it's very good for producing a nice fine seed bed for weeds to grow in, but uh, it's not sort of a recommended tool these days as far as best soil management goes, because it does really churn things up into a pretty fine uh, tilt. Then there's been some other fairly amazing sort of um, uh, creations produced over the years, uh, diesel driven steam weeders such as this one, um, LPG driven steam weeders as well. In days when we're trying to decarbonize our, our economy, uh, it seems to be hardly the right way to go when we're using lots of fossil fuel to try and uh, get weed control. So yeah, again, I think we've moved on from there. Things like the, the line trimmer, there's a few different um, varieties of these on the market these days. They do seem to be very effective at, uh, at gaining um, some weed control. And in this case, in South Africa, where they just went through once at, um, just before bud burst and uh, getting, giving undervine area a bit of a cleanup. And then more recently, things like the finger weed that have come on the market, and they also seem to be a, a very effective tool. And I think Tom is going to be talking at some uh, length about, uh, about these and trials that he's done with them. So yes, there are numerous tools out there. There's a lot more than what we've shown here and what Robin will be describing later in, um, in some of the toolkits. Um, we'll describe them further. But is it really the way we want to be going as far as the longer term management of the Zundervine zone, the varying um, replacements for herbicides, or can we do it better? And that's what we want to address a little bit further in this discussion. So for those who will um, allow things to germinate, and, and grow in the undervine, then they are willing to um, just come through with the mower. In this case, a twin-sided unit for up in the riverland who get over large areas fairly quickly. Or we can look at mulching and, and that might be straw or, or um, uh, compost-based products. Of course, mulches that are all imported to the vineyard and work very effectively. Um, they do come at a cost though. You need to be in, a, in an environment where you can access the straw fairly cheaply without huge transport costs. And it does have to come in in a clean state as well without importing weeds and you don't want any nasty uh, chemical residues left over. So you need to be sure of the, the source of it. And uh, yes, yeah, so there, there is a, a price to be paid for it as anyone has, uh, would know is used to, but you, you can usually amortize, amortize that over sort of three or four years. Then we've got other products on the market these days. Um, this is uh, courtesy of Darren Fahey from uh, New South Wales DPI, he gave a presentation at the, the uh, Wine Tech Conference in 2019 about this, some work he'd done with it. So these are all knockdown herbicides again. Um, uh, they don't have any, any capacity for systemic uh, control of, of plants. So yes, so they can be effective, but as we can see here, they also come at a fair cost of application as well. Um, and so, you know, all these are inputs of varying forms or another. And I guess where we're trying to take it now is can we get away from, from um, the use of these inputs by producing a more resilient, robust system in our vineyards that doesn't require any of this, is, which is the ideal, which we'd like to take it to. And I think it is possible. So, sorry. Um, so if we see here, the, uh, this is a photo taken from Brussels a few years ago. Um, we can use plants for weed control. And that's where I'm coming from. In this case, triticale, it's a, a wonderful cereal, very uh, um, uh, aggressive in its growth habit. And it outcompetes nearly everything that is um, going to be growing in that environment. Um, and so you can use plants such as this to, uh, to get on top of, of weed control and um, avoid problems, I should say. But as we see in this situation, we've still got that undervine area, which is, is still bare or fairly bare and uh, can be herbicided fairly soon. 
in the, the, the hot inland regions, we can look at some other forms of cover crops. All the, you know, what we're going to be talking about today is, is going to be fairly region specific as to what we might be growing there. For this region, we've done work in the past. In this case, it's um, a, a prostrate saltbush called Atroplex semi-bicata and grows wonderfully well in, in many of those regions. And growing it in the midrow like that is having very little impact on water relations with the vines. So they can grow quite happily with the, the, what's being supplied through the dripper and the salt bush will, will uh, grow quite happily with what's in the, the midrow. And it's got a nice deep root system. And um, it out competes things like caltrop and so on, wireweed, other things that might be growing in that midrow over the, the summer growing period. There's um, no issues there at all, which is you know, a pleasant change from those who are in cow trot producing regions and um, they can grow laying down on the ground on top of a saltbush plant very happily without getting needle pricks. Uh, you can use other plants and here we did work with uh, wallaby grass, this is down in the Coonawarra and again once it's established it's pretty slow to get going but once established it uh, competes really nicely against things like, like uh, wireweed and so on. Whoops, I'm having to use the mouse here to, to do it. Um, so in, in other cases, you just don't worry about it. What you've got growing there is fine. Um, a bit like earlier on where we had barley grass and so on. This is up in the, um, the hot regions again, up near Wentworth. Um, and there's a variety of kinopod-like uh, species growing in the, the mid-row there, a bit of uh, spear grass and so on mixed in with it. Nice and biodiverse um, supply of plants. And they look after uh, providing habitat for beneficials, so there's no concerns here about uh, light brown apple moth and so on compared to some of the other vineyards where they've been trying to grow cover crops. Um, and that might get rolled or mowed once a year and that's it for our management. It makes life pretty easy. Just getting back to management, we had, you know, we grow, can grow these wonderful big um, uh, tall stands of triticale and that sort of thing. In this case, it's an oak crop, so you can just roll it down. It's, I see it as being a much preferred option is if you're looking for weed control over the summer than using a mower which breaks material up into much finer pieces um, and and once that happens then it breaks down very quickly and you've got no cover left on the soil surface which leaves it open to, to weeds to invade. So this to me is a, a much preferred option, it's nice and cheap and uh, uh, robust, you know, the machines don't break down so readily. Um, of course this is just for, for trials, this little narrow one you get them uh, made to the required widths for your vineyard. Or you can use sheep. And uh, I think these are still a very, uh, pretty underutilized tool. Often vineyard managers don't see themselves as being graziers as well, but they, um, if you can uh, get some sheep in on adjustment over the, the winter, early spring period, it can be very effective. And in this case, it's um, up in the Riverland, a high trellis, and these um, uh, dorp across Sheep are grazing quite happily underneath that trellis. Uh, they'll munch away on a few of the lower leaves and lower bunches, but essentially there's, there's very little damage to the, to the vines. And, um, and that's the weed control, 365 days a year. Um, preferably managed in a rotational grazing fashion, uh, but it certainly can work quite well again and very low input. But this is the way we're, we're thinking of going as well, is that um, we've shown that, that cover crops can work very well in the mid row and more recently we've shown that we can in uh, in all environs that we try them in and that's the Riverland, Langhorn Creek, Barossa and Eden Valley. So long as you select the right species and in this case it is medic and ryegrass, early flowering species so competition for water with the vines is limited. Um, we can grow them very successfully without inhibiting yield and in some cases having significant impacts on improving yield if the soil has been is fairly clapped out. So here we are going towards full cover. It hasn't quite got there yet, just from um, the, the medic migrating laterally from the, the mid row to the undervine area. We haven't actually sowed it in this particular area. Many, many uh, sites we did. So, so that is the way we're going. So uh, I guess what we're looking to do is try and encourage you, if you can, to, um, to look at going down that road with the right species for your particular environment, which are not going to require any, um, any input from you as far as tillage or herbicides or, or mowing or anything. If you've got the right species, they will naturally senesce and just lay down of their own accord. Just briefly, and Tom will go into this further with his talk, 
we were able to increase them at the Barossa site organic carbon levels by 50%, which is amazing. We aren't taking any carbon off because we are not grazing it, we're not mowing it or anything like that. And, uh, and that was uh, quite substantial. There's a problem there with, with salinity and where we're growing cover crops, we, delete, we decrease salinity substantially. We decrease penetration resistance in the top 20 centimetres um, as well. And so that's improving the capacity for water infiltration and so on. This is just by having cover crops in that undervine zone. We decrease water stress, improve earthworm numbers, showed no, no yield suppression over four sites compared to the herbicide controls, and we improve gross margins at, uh, at three of those sites, not in the Riverland, um, but all other sites we did. So it, was, um, it worked fairly well. So, so now we've got the mid row that we can grow cover crops in, we can grow if we've got the right species, we can grow them under vine as well. And I suggest pretty much in all regions of, um, of Australia's wine growing areas. Um, and so we've come a, a fair way from those early slides. So what we're trying to do here is provide environmental enhancement by, by whatever cover crops we're growing. They all, they all need to be cost effective. So things like the, the wallaby grass, which we showed early on, the seed is pretty expensive there um, so you might want to be only growing that every 10 rows or so if you wanted to, to be put it in the system as part of a, a habitat enhancement uh, but otherwise the seed for things like the medic and ryegrass and so on is is very readily available and uh, and, and not too expensive we're looking to, to lower fossil fuel requirements and, and instead use solar power in other words photosynthesis to produce these um, th these plants which are then going to enhance uh, soil health and, and general ecosystem services within the, the vineyard. They need to be readily implemented and I think we can. Uh, none of these are too difficult to, to, um, to sow uh, and to get established or to just modify what we might have there in the vineyard already. And also looking to get them to fit the vineyard ecosystem with the required productivity outcomes. So in some cases you might be looking to try and reduce vigour for instance and you can, you can get cover crops that will do that. But in most cases where we're water limited, we're looking to have uh, species which are going to be winter active and then shut down for the rest of the season. So for, for, from our work, we suggest that annual, annual medics, clovers, grasses, such as rye, early season rye grass, um, will all provide competition and suppression of weeds once you get a good seed bank established. And depending on the weeds as well, some of them just won't respond to that sort of um, uh, um, competition and in some areas. Um, I'll look into that in a moment. Sheep can provide that winter weed suppression if you get yourself set up for them with some uh, water and some fencing and so on and get access to the sheep. And that can happen in, uh, in those uh, high trellis vineyards for a longer period of time. In general though, their removal in spring allows those cover crops to set large amounts of seed, which is really good and uh, getting that seed bank established uh, for following years. And largely mechanical and chemical intervention is going to be uh, minimized, if not removed completely, once we get these systems established. So I think that's, that's a pretty uh, important one. So just to provide that though, regarding that warm inland region, um, the work that we did there, we weren't able to get the growth on the, the medics and ryegrass and so on in the undervine area to provide a mulch when it senesced to then suppress the growth of these pretty aggressive weeds like prickly lettuce, flea bane and, and milk thistle. So, I mean, we've only essentially done three years of work there. Tom is doing some work in that area again now, um, but it's still pretty early days as to how we might get on top of those things in the longer term. Um, yeah, so, you know, watch the space, I think. Um, certainly if you can get sheep in there though, well, they would keep them under control if, um, if you're able to do that, the mowing and herbicides might be required. So just to conclude, I'd like to suggest to you that um, weed management is more than what is, in the what is the best tool to remove unwanted plants. I mean, we, we, it's not just a, a replacement exercise for, for herbicides. Uh, they can be certainly great tools to, to work in the interim as we move towards a, a, a reduced input system. So we need to think about how we can migrate that floor management to requiring mineral inputs and, and what sort of plant species are going to work best in particular environments to achieve that and then how you might get them established if they aren't there already. Consider, consider them, consider what you've got, got growing there already and whether you can manipulate them 
um, to become what might be more suitable for your vineyard. And that by manipulation, I might uh, suggest, you know, things like mowing high to, to take out the taller growing weeds um, and stopping them from setting seed. But some of those that might be down lower might be desirable species and, uh, and allow them to set seed instead. And uh, yeah, they're rolling at various times and that sort of thing. Certainly enjoy the benefits of the free nitrogen. I think much of the success that we've had in the past has been through the legumes in these systems and the nitrogen that they've provided, uh, which has been, uh, which has really made, uh, really driven the systems, made the soil health um, so much better and, and the vine health as well. Australian temperate pasture species, I mentioned before, readily available and um, they fit in the, the vineyard system also very well. A change in perception of how a vineyard should look may be required. And I think this is going to be a, a, a um, bit of a hurdle for many to try and jump over as to how they, they see their, their, the vineyard and whether they um, are comfortable with it being a little bit untidy. Just because the, the vineyard is not manicured does not mean it's not, managed, not well managed and you might have to convince others that is the case. Remembering bare soil across the vineyard floor was once seen as best management practice. So thankfully, we've moved on a long way to what um, our best management practices these days is, is very, very different. And so what I suggest here is just like beards and Allen Berg, so too, I think, is a slightly scruffy vineyard. So um, feel comfortable in moving forward with, uh, with that in mind. So with that, I'd like to thank you all very much and uh, look forward to any questions later. Good day. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Um, I bet you're feeling good about your uh, about beards being in vogue now. Um, you've really cultivated yours over over the years and uh, <laughs> uh, it's reaching its pinnacle now. <laughs> um, and thank you for jumping in so quickly um, when we were having some technical issues um, here. And thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, in my fluster, um, I um, didn't introduce Chris uh, properly. So um, I'll just uh, run through Chris's bio now. So Chris Penfold's roots are from a broad acre farm at Tumby Bay on Air Peninsula. He gained an agriculture degree and postgraduate diploma in natural resource management from Rose Roseworthy Agricultural College and later a master's in agricultural science, which was the culmination of an eight year investigation of organic and biodynamic broad acre farming systems. In 2000, he started the journey in viticultural research, which included investigating non-chemical weed control, native cover cropping options, organic and biodynamic systems, and most recently, under vine cover cropping as an alternative to the application of herbicides for weed control. After 30 years, he has retired from research at the University of Adelaide, uh, but we will not let Paul Chris have a rest. And he now says he enjoys working part time at the, with the AWRI and conducting organic audits for NASA, along with some recreational flying and travel when possible. Thank you, Chris. Um, for those of you who haven't met Chris, he is an incredible wealth of knowledge and just a really lovely chap to, um, <laughs> to have a chat with. And if you don't have Chris's contact details, um, please contact us via the AWRI help desk. You can find the details on our website and um, you can we can put you in touch with um, Chris. Highly recommend having a chat with him. Thank you, Chris. And now um, we are moving on to Thomas Lyons. Uh, so Dr. Thomas Lyons is currently working with Professor Tim Cavanaro at the University of Adelaide on quantifying the effects of undervined cover cropping. He finds motivation in providing an evidence base which growers can use to make informed decisions to improve their industry. Uh, so before Tom started in this field, he studied, studied algal uh, phys physiology, goodness me, I should have read this before, chemical engineering and biochemistry. Uh, thank you, Tom, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks, Robin, and thanks, Chris, as well. Um, okay, so let's get this on the right screen. Okay, 
I can assume, oh no, you can't even see my screen now. I'll, I'll share the right screen, here we go. Okay. So, maybe I need to, we should have practiced this before. I just assume that I can do it all the time, don't I? All right, here we go. Is that the right screen? You can just see my slides and perhaps me in the side there. Um, I'm just gonna assume, <laughs> thanks Ron. I'm just gonna assume that's right and um, and get started. So I am going to race through um, a couple of research trials that I've been, been doing. Um, I'll summarize them briefly and, um, and get going into some of the data and um, the experience that we've had. So, Why would you be interested in non-herbicide weed management? Robin's covered that. Um, Chris has covered that. Um, you know, you might want to improve soil health. Um, we're looking at a herbicide ban or increased regulation as well. So you might need a, a contingency plan for that. And I'd, I'd recommend that sort of thinking. Um, and if you're, you know, being a good, a, a good um, viticulturist, thinking about the costs and, and where you're putting the, um, the money in your vineyard, and what benefit you're getting from it. So they're, you know, they're the broad reasons you might be thinking about this, this space. So as I said, I'm gonna be talking about two trials um, in this talk. The first one is on undervine weed management. And that was a trial that we carried out um, down in Padthaway using um, or comparing straw mulch and, and compost and the mechanical weeder to the herbicide, um, herbicide undervine control. Um, and then later on, we'll be talking about the undervine cover cropping, which is the work that I, um, Chris started all those years ago and um, I've been uh, privileged enough to, to work on with him. So I will get started with the, the Padthaway trial, which is under vine weed management really focused, but we didn't use any, any um, cover crops there. And so that's why it's, you know, it's one style of, of under vine weed management, um, sans herbicide. Uh, and I always just like to say thanks to everyone who, who was part of the, the trial first. Um, it's been, it's been good and it's still ongoing. So this trial started in, in, uh, 2019, uh, or mid late 2018, actually, I think. Um, and so we got some, um, some data and we're still collecting yield data. So these are the treatments that we looked at down there. Um, we've got a mechanical weeder, which is actually the same photo that Chris shared before, you know, it has, has these fingers and, a, and light tillage behind. Um, then we've got mulch, which is applied at about 55 tons per, the he uh, per hectare, uh, and then mulch plus compost where we applied the, uh, the compost um, at 10 tons per hectare. So as Chris was saying, it is really important um, to know actually what you're putting in there because um, unsurprisingly, these things, you know, drastically change your soil. And here's a, here's a bit bigger of an image of, um, of that weeder. So we measured a lot of different things down in Pathway and um, in a few slides time, there will be a QR code. If you, if, if you scan the QR code or, or you can send me an email, if, if that doesn't work for you, um, you can get a copy of the final report from that trial. So we looked at the soil, we looked at um, leaf, uh, leaf blade composition, moisture, temperature, um, nitrogen, all these sorts of things. And then we had two sites. So we had one Accolade and one at Farmer's Leap. They're quite different different sites. And at both sites, we, we um, measured all sorts of yield data. So I'm not gonna go over all the data today, uh, but just some of the interesting points. And so this is the yield that we collected this year. So 2021, um, those trials have been in there for three, three years now. So we're seeing significant differences in the yield, um, which, is, which is really interesting. Uh, so I hope you can see my mouse. Um, over on the left here, we've got herbicide, um, which has the lowest yield and mulch with the highest yield at Accolade site. So Accolade is sort of at the bottom of the valley or the bottom of the hill in Padthaway um, with siltier, loamier and, and a bit of clay um, sort of soil. Uh, so there's not a lot of nutrient leaching, which I think might be why the mulch and compost didn't do as well as it did at um, Farmer's Leap. So, but also important to note that these are, these are quite high quality um, fruit being picked here. So the differences between these treatments is on the order of 500 grams per metre. You know? So it's still a significant percentage, um, but you know, not huge volumes of fruit here. Um, whereas at Farmer's Leap, we've got um, mulch and compost yielding the highest. And this is you know, only after a few years of, of um, 
that he's been in place, uh, whereas the mechanical weed control and herbicide um, still significantly lower than that. So that's more what I was expecting to see, but um, you know, pleasantly surprised by the mechanical weed at, um, at the accolade site with um, sort of uh, mid-range performance there. Uh, if we look back at the 2019 data, so this is what you might expect to see after implementing these practices for, for just, you know, six months. Um, and then you've got, you know, a fair bit of variability and no real differences or trends observed. Although, interestingly, the mulch at both sites um, saw a bit of a dip in yield, um, though this was not significant. So um, this could be due to nitrogen drawdown, I imagine. Um, so you might expect that, but after a couple of years uh, of these being in place, um, the system adapts and, and starts working itself out. So fundamentally, I guess the, the question for this trial was, you know, how effective are these methods at removing the weeds? And unsurprisingly, they're all quite effective. Herbicide works a treat. Uh, mechanical weed control um, does tend to leave a small mound directly underneath the vines and underneath the drippers um, that allows some space for, for weeds that are just only knocked over or, or pushed about a bit to persist and they can still um, cover a bit of the soil. So that's why we saw uh, a higher percentage of ground cover for the mechanical weed control and mulch and the mulch and compost treatments obviously completely smother the ground. So they're very effective at, at controlling the weeds. Um, but note that you know still only or less than nine percent of the the undervine space was covered by by weeds so still relatively good um weed control so that difference in in weed control i think led to this this difference in um canopy or leaf area index the canopy size in that first year for the mechanical weeding um, system uh, this is data from accolade as well and we saw that, that dip in, um, in leaf area index at the fluorescence time point, um, which was significant. Uh, but later on in the season, um, I believe that those vines caught up. Uh, and though you still might see slightly smaller canopies, they, they weren't so far behind. So interest, it's, yeah, it really is interesting and surprising for me to see that after three years, um, the mechanical weeding hasn't led to a sort of persistent um, reduction in canopy size and reduced yield. So, yes, to summarise, and I know I'm going at 100 miles an hour, um, these, these treatments were effective at suppressing weeds. Um, the mulch and compost had, had a significant effect, especially at Farmer's Leap, um, which is, has sandier soil where there's much higher risk of um, nutrient leaching. So all that humus and, and nutrients in the, um, in the compost, I think, led to a real stimulation of those vines and they were getting you know, 10 kilos per meter, um, which was not that much fun to pick <laughs> um, last season. Um, and yes, the compost also leads to a big, big effect on the, um, the nutrient status of the, the vines and, and the nutrient content of the soil. So um, I'll tick along now to the, the second half of my talk, which is the, the undervine cover cropping work that Chris and I worked on. Um, also with, with Tim Cavaniera and, and Joe Marks, who's going to give a talk in a uh, couple of weeks, I believe, to the AWRI as well. So um, stay tuned for his work. Um, yes, thanks to everyone who's been involved in, in that work. So let's sort of step into the vineyard and I'll slow down for a minute and we can, we can think conceptually about, about what we're doing. So this is a great, a great image that describes, you know, really the, the, the diametrically opposed methods for undermine management. So if you're an ecologist and you look at this, you can, you can summarize it this way. So what we've got here is a monoculture, um, you know, just vines and soil, that's it. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got an ecosystem. There's grasses, legumes, other plants and organisms all interacting and the grapevines are part of that system. And so I think as a viticulturist, it's probably a good idea to regularly, you know, question while you're doing it. I'm not a viticulturist though, so, you know, I don't <laughs> claim to tell you what you should do, but um, let's, just, let's just think about this for a minute. What, how much is it costing you to maintain that, that undervine um, bare strip? You know, Chris has talked about that. It's going to cost fuel. Um, 
you know, you've actually got to buy the herbicide, obviously, labour. You've got to run through a few times per season. That's okay. Things in, in agriculture cost money. Um, so what are you getting for that investment in this space? Um, I think I would argue that what you're getting is control. Um, the sense that, you know, what you're adding to this space is um, under your control, what you're removing. Uh, and that, that allows you to tweak the dials and, um, and manage what you're doing um, perhaps most effectively, or that's how it feels anyway. Um, an important question to ask at the same time is what don't you get? So, you know, you're selecting this, this one option, you're selecting the, the bare earth option. There's obviously another option and it's not all bad in one and all good in the other. It's not that simple. If you're, if you're spraying out the undervine, you're missing out on all sorts of things. So I've got to go forward. So um, you're not getting any roots in the soil. So there's a, there's a huge amount of biomass here. There's a lot of, lot of underground biomass and um, roots provide a lot of benefits to the soil. So they provide a habitat and nutrient source for fungi. Um, and that includes mycorrhizal fungi and mycorrhizae can help plants get access to nutrients and water. It's been, been shown in the literature. You're also not getting rhizobia in the soil in the, in the bare earth um, method. So that provides organic nitrogen um, to your vines throughout the season as that um, organic nitrogen breaks down. Uh, these, these undervine cover crops are also improving your soil structure and reducing the compaction of your soil. They're also increasing soil carbon and, and increasing water infiltration rates. So there's a lot of benefits here just from the roots alone. You're also getting a mulch. And, you know, we know there are benefits to mulch. We just talked about that. Um, you know, the, the benefits of placing an artificial mulch in the undervine space. This is a, an active organic mulch. Um, that can lead to, if you get enough biomass, can reduce evaporation rates, um, still provide habitat for, for beneficial insects and, and have effects on the temperature. So, uh, and this also leads to changes in, in fruit quality and these sorts of things. So there are benefits to some species and there are you know, downsides to others. So it is really important, um, the species that you select for this process. Uh, and you know, in our sort of, in our way of carrying out these trials, we're trying to understand better how, how to select the right species. So the species is important. It's not the, the most critical thing because you're trying to build an ecosystem, but, but the, the players that you put in, in, um, in play right at the beginning are, are quite important. So um, as Chris said earlier, leguminous mixes with, with some annual grasses uh, have been really effective in terms of um, leading to, to good yields, as good or better than the herbicides. Um, and we do have some perennial grasses to really show you what happens if you have, have quite aggressive um, things growing in the undivide space. You do see downsides um, if yield is, is, is the bottom line. Um, and it's important to plant a mix of species because they can fill all the different niches in the soil and that will reduce the, the invasion of, of other species. And you know, it's important to select the species because say for example, you know, glyphosate was banned tomorrow, what would you um, what would you have in the um, in the ground? You'd, you'd only have these species that you've put in. So it's it's good to be on the front foot with this. Get get a species mix and, and a seed bank of things that you want to be present and manage that. I think that's um that's a really good approach going forward. So as I said, we've looked at a lot of different species. Um, these are their names: medic mixes, some some grasses, and I'll, I'll go through some images of those now just so you can see what they look like. So this is obviously that the herbicide undervine the standard practice. Um, here we've got the medic and rye. Uh, use my mouse again so you can see that the tall, you know, everyone knows what, what Roundup resistant rye looks like. This is non Roundup resistant. Um, although who would know because we never sprayed them out. And then you've got medic, um, medicargo here, which is that legume um, providing the, the nitrogen, fixing nitrogen to break down through the season. And then because these trials are quite a few years old now, that's recruited. A whole heap of barley grass. I think you know I regularly see oats and things in that space, um, but it's not it's not critical. This is this soil is finding a balance um, that works really well. 
Here we've got the, um, the straw mulch on the left and more ryegrass and, and medic on the right. Um, the fescue here, um, which is one of those grasses that we, we thought was uh, an annual species, but actually it turns out it really likes water. And if you keep providing water, it keeps growing. So um, I'd call this a, really a perennial grass. And this does lead to the biggest um, devigoration of the, you know, if you let me make a word up, um, re reduction in canopy size of the vines. And then uh, we also have fescue and clover. This was a mix. Um, the clover did really well for a few years and then the fescue has said thanks very much for all the nitrogen and, and taken over since then. So it's largely just a fescue, tri uh, a fescue treatment now. And last but not least, we've got the, the wallaby grass, which is our native, native grass species, um, which has persisted and grown really well. Um, hasn't colonized the space on the vine quite so much, but I think um, there's definitely space for using these native grasses in, in um, in vineyard floor management. It's a way of mixing, it's a matter of figuring out how to mix them in so to get the benefits from them and perhaps in the mid rows is a really good way to do that. So last but not least is, is a bit of cyanobacteria. I think as an algal physiologist uh, previously, always excited to see a bit of algae, but probably not what you want to see in your vineyard. So I was talking about that aggressive grass a moment ago. This is a, a nice figure, um, a nice couple of photos taken on the same day at Langhorn Creek. And you can see this is, you know, start of summer, the vines are fairly well developed and the, um, the casbah here is still really green, growing quite happily. Um, on the right here, on the medic treatment, the medic is also nest. Um, there's, there's a bit of, you know, dry grass on the ground. A few things are still growing, but um, the vines are very happy. So you can, you can just see that the difference in the canopy size um, between the two treatments. So that's visually, that's the sort of effect um, that your, your species selection can, can have on the, um, on the grapevine canopy. So the canopy size also has other effects, right? So if you've got a smaller canopy, there's more sun getting in, hitting the fruit. Um, there's also more sun hitting the ground and reflecting up. So, um, we measured temperature last year, and so we'll get we'll get stuck into a bit of the data. Um, we put we put some temperature loggers um, at, at ground height, um, middle of the trunk, and then at cordon height, and saw some interesting and opposing effects actually at the different um, at our different sites. So at Nuriupa, where we have um, not much irrigation going on, um, we saw a straw mulch was was really able to maintain. A very cool soil surface which is exactly what you'd expect that's not rocket science but it didn't, didn't work quite as well at um at langhorn creek where there's a lot of irrigation whereas where there's a lot of irrigation i think the soil is maintaining um quite a cool temperature regardless so the straw doesn't have as much of, of a benefit um, when you're using high rates of irrigation whereas at langhorn creek where there, where there was lots of irrigation we saw um a massive well, a relative increase in, um, in, in temperature of the canopy um, at, at um, sorry, am I missing something, Robin? I'm just giving you the cue that uh, we're cl close to time. Oh, yep, yeah, got it. Okay, I'll speed up. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, high temperatures with small canopy, so that makes, makes total sense. So let me, let me pick and choose some of them. The, um, the more interesting bits of data that we've got. So soil carbon, Chris said, it, it goes up with cover crops. That's exactly what you see at both sites. Um, and Joe Marks is going to be talking about that in an AWRI webinar soon, as, uh, with Tim Cavanier, I believe. Um, microbial diversity goes up with cover crops. As you'd expect, I'm, ho I'm hoping you can see these slides as I go through. And um, soil compaction goes down if you plant cover crops. And finally, yields with cover crops, if you pick the right ones, they stay the same or go up really. Um, and if you pick aggressive grasses, you can get devigoration and um, lower yields. So um, that can be a benefit for some people and depending on your climate, you can pick and choose the cover crops that you're gonna try and get into your vineyard to have the, the best effect for, for what you're looking for. Use them as a tool, I think is a, is a good approach. So this is the 2021 yield data. 
Um, we saw the cover crops not doing any worse than the herbicide, except for perhaps the, the aggressive grasses. Um, and then in 2020, um, the year before, exactly the same trend. Um, though these, are, these aren't huge trends. So I think to summarize, you've, you've got the message, if you could listen to how fast I speak, um, if you could follow that, then you can hear, you know, yield is kind of going up or staying about the same. Canopy size um, increases or stays the same compared to the herbicide, whereas the competitive grasses, you get a smaller canopy, and then we're getting higher soil carbon and, and some free nitrogen as well. So thank you, and sorry to rush through, through so much, but there's a lot of information, I think, and it's a very, um, well, it's a complicated field. You all, you all know that uh, you're trying to manage lots of different um, factors, you know, nutrients and water and canopy size and fruit quality and, and how easy all this is to manage. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a nuanced topic and um, it's good to, to, to get your head around, but it doesn't have to be complicated, I think. Um, yeah, don't be, don't be scared of, by it. So um, with that, I think I'm one minute over my 20 minutes. So um, thanks very much. I'll hand you back. Hand, hand you back to Robin. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, you jam packed a lot of information into 20 minutes. Thank you. We've got a heap of questions. Um, so, um, yeah, we'll get you back right. in the panel session to start sure. answering them. Uh, in the meantime, I will give this another crack. Uh, so, as I mentioned, um, Chris Penfold, uh, Marcel Essling and I have been working on a non-chemical weed control uh, project here at the AWRI, and I just wanted to run through uh, what we've come up with uh, quickly uh, with you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about why non-chem weed control, which um, Chris and Tom both have covered. Uh, the process we went through to develop some tools and resources uh, that you can use, um, what those resources are and where you can find them. And uh, we've created a decision support tool, so I'll uh, run through that with you as well. So why non-chem weed control? Well, to be honest, there's just been a, an overwhelming amount of interest um, from growers all over Australia about managing weeds without herbicides or with a reduced number of herbicide applications. And it's been for various reasons. It's um, either conversion to organics, concerns about chemical safety, concern for the environment, and uh, an increasing focus on building soil health a desire to decrease their inputs, um, concerns about herbicide resistance, and also concerns about market um, access and also consumer perception of chemical use in vineyards. Um, so as Tom uh, mentioned uh, in his last slide, non-chem weed control is, is not a simple uh, topic. Uh, so no one size fits all. Um, so it depends on the site conditions. So the weather conditions, your soil conditions, slope, water availability, pest and disease pressure. Um, also uh, influenced by vine properties, such as vine age, vine vigor, yields and quality targets, uh, and also the weed properties. So the weed type you have, the abundance of the weeds, the life cycle, so, um, and where those weeds are found. So um, Tom mentioned that some plants grown in some areas can be annual. And if they are grown in a, a highly um, irrigated area, they can um, become um, perennial. Um, and then there's also business related um, factors. So the, the budget of, of the particular vineyard and the vineyard management priorities. So is it key to really increase um, maximize yield or is quality a real um, factor? Um, is it more about sustainability, um, those sorts of things? And, and what about the equipment and the labor that you already have available to you? 
and that's another factor. <clears throat> so it's quite complicated. Oh, sorry, gosh. So as part of this, um, uh, to, to create these resources and understanding how complex um, it all is um, and how diverse uh, vineyards are uh, across Australia, we thought that the best um, way to get cracking with this project was to interview growers who were managing uh, weeds uh, with either no, no herbicides or a limited amount of herbicides. And so we interviewed um, over 20 growers from all across Australia and we asked them about the main weeds that they had in their vineyard, the main weed control tools that they used um, now and what they used in the past. And then also asked them about what weed control um, tools they would like to consider um, for the future and what was holding them back towards that, uh, towards moving towards that. Um, and then also the strategies that they used to control um, weeds in general and then strategies to control problem weeds. So cooch was a, a main one that we talked about. So after these interviews, uh, we uh, developed a whole heap of case studies and these will progressively be, become available online as um, we polish them off for you. Um, so this one here, the hand-picked wines case study uh, will be available from early next week on our, on our website. Um, so it gives you an, a background of, of hand-picked wines. We focused on their vineyard in the Yarra Valley, um, talks about um, their weed control practices and overview, um, and then specific information about how they manage weeds in the mid row, how they manage weeds under vine, um, the types of equipment that they use, um, any challenges that they have and where, where to next. So there's a huge amount of information um, there for you to access. And as I said, um, we will keep adding more case studies as, as we um, finish them off. So generally, um, from our conversations, we realized that most growers use a combination of a number of different tools. It's not just one tool that they say, yep, that's the perfect tool, I'm going to roll with that. They generally have quite a number of different tools that, that they use for different situations, different um, seasons, um, different weed um, types. And this is the key, the list of the key weeds that um, growers provided us with. Um, and so for each of these weeds, we have created a fact sheet that um, helps, will help growers to um, identify the particular weed. Um, it tells, gives you information about the life cycle, um, uh, the best non-chemical weed control methods that have been used by, by growers. And it also gives you um, towards the end some grower experience information. So it's just how particular growers have had success in controlling um, a particular weed. So there's a huge amount of information there as well for you to have a look at. Um, and in the interviews, we identified um, these 11 tools as the main tools that growers use across um, Australia. So the growers that we've interviewed, um, it's obviously not an, not an exhaustive list. And so for each of those these tools, we have developed a, um, a fact sheet. And these fact sheets, um, give you a, an understanding of how the particular tool works, um, gives you some examples of that particular tool, talks about the advantages and disadvantages of that particular tool, and then how well that tool works in different soil types. 
Um, and then some tips for success and again some more growers experience in there as well um, so and there's a link to videos as well so you should have a huge amount of information um, to help you to make decisions um, from the interviews we gathered information about um, growers experience about using different tools in different situations and so that's where we've come up with this table of the different weed control methods um, and the different soil types and how easy it is for it has been for growers to use this particular tool in these um, different conditions. And similarly, we have looked at the different um, tools and uh, how well they are, how well they um, work at um, doing certain things. So how well they um, work at reducing competition, weed competition with vines, how well they work in young vineyards, um, their operating speed, for example, how much soil disturbance there is. And we have come up with, we've pulled all of this information together. Um, oops, sorry. And we have created an online tool which will allow growers to go in and select their minimum rainfall. So say your minimum rainfall is 250 mil uh, per annum. And say you're in a, a limited, you're, you're in an area where water is really limited and you're focusing on undervine uh, weed control and your soil type will say is sand. So then you submit that, that question and you get um, provided with a list of the options that may be suited to your particular um, situation. And when you click on each of these um, tools, it will take you to that fact sheet for that particular um, tool. So we also recommend that you look at the case studies um, when you've fine tuned the, um, the tools that you want to consider, go, go and have a look at the case studies, see how they've been used um, by other people. Uh, contact us at the AWRI, you can have a chat to Chris about how this particular tool would work in your situation. We've had questions already about frost, which we'll talk about um, a bit later. And so I'll just change up the uh, parameters here so that you can see. Um, so as you change the parameters, um, the tools that you can should consider for that particular um, situation will change. Um, so as the rainfall increases, more cover crops become available to you um, in more sandy, uh, stony um, gravel soils. Um, some of those cultivation tools become quite difficult to use. So um, the list of cultivation tools um, becomes uh, lower. So the intention of the non-chem weed control tool is to provide growers with options to consider. So it's um, providing information to help growers evaluate um, these different tools and how they might work on your individual, um, in your individual situation and on your particular site. Um, they also, it's also aimed to help growers manage more, manage weeds more effectively with either no herbicides or reduced herbicides. So those tips about how to manage um, particular weeds and the, the life cycle um, is, is really aimed to help um, get, no matter what tool you decide to use, it's aiming to um, get uh, improve the efficacy of your weed control. So the intention of the weed, non-chem weed control tool is not to provide growers with a definitive answer. Um, that is pretty much impossible, uh, which is uh, what we've realized 
um, throughout this process, but it's really to start that conversation, to give you things to consider um, and to provide you with other resources that you can really go to to um, gather more information. Um, so we would really like to thank um, Landcare who um, has provided funding for um, this project. Um, we would also like to, I'd like to thank my colleagues at the AWRI who have put in a huge amount of effort to get this um, all ready. Um, and sorry, um, my voice is conking out. And um, there has been a huge amount of generosity from growers from around Australia. So Bart Maloney, Andrew Butler, Prue Henschke, Troy Ellicker, Richard Lees, Liz Riley, Steve Schiller, Carl Schiller, Bruce Basham, Hans Loder, Kerry DeGarris, Tim Byrne, James Aubrey, uh, Damien Sharkey and Barry Williams. Um, I have probably forgotten some, but um, they have been incredibly helpful and generous with their time and information. And um, Tim and Tom from the University of Adelaide have also been very generous in helping us to review um, the cover crop case study, a uh, cover crop fact sheet. Um, so I thank them. And um, just to let you know, we are running workshops on um, non-chem weed control in various regions around the country. Um, and these workshops will be very much uh, regional specific. So we'll have case studies from that particular region and you'll be up, <coughs> excuse me, you'll be able to ask questions that are specific to your region. So now before my voice will conk out, I think we'll go straight into the Q&A. So I'd like to take over the questions for Robin. So we'll start from the beginning. Um, we have a question that says, in relation to spring frost, the general recommendation is for moist grass slash weed free mid rows and undivine areas. What would be the best technique to manage this issue in relation to using mulches, undivine cover crops? Good question, go, Tom. Chris? There you go. Look, I don't think, I don't have a conclusive answer for that. Um, I think, yeah, that you've, you've, got to, you've got to balance these these things against themselves. Um, we didn't see surprisingly huge differences in yield a couple of years ago when, when we were frosted out in um, in Europe, but um, I guess on a large scale, you know, you're going to have more, you're going to have more of a drastic effect on the small scale climate of, of a vineyard. So um, yeah, I think, I mean, there's still place for, for frost fans and things like this, but um, it's, it's a balance. Um, and I'm not sure if there's there's too much um, too much evidence either way. Do you know of any, Chris? No. Well, the the the, um, the best practice seems to be to keep things fairly low in the vineyard as far as mowing or, or rolling or whatever. Um, people do seem to like to avoid straw mulch, for instance, like in the, the picture here uh, in frosty areas. Um, but others have, have, other growers have said though that the frost is often just so random that um, they can't see any, as we found at the, that um, Nuri site, um, the impacts of undervine cover crops or mulch or whatever seem to be outweighed by the randomness of the frost event and, um, and they weren't sure that there was really any impact coming from it. So it's really, you know, growers I think know their vineyards much better than, than, than uh, any of us do. Uh, it's really up to them to, to take it on board as, as to whether they want to go down the track of um, looking at these options with that risk involved. Right. Um, next question. Do you need to spray everything out till and then seed to develop an effective cover crop that minimises weed infiltration? So have we go, Tom? Yeah, yeah, go for it. So... Preferably, and all our trials have, have been in um, in conventional vineyards, which have been herbicided prior to the, the, the sowing of these cover crops. 
And so that is, is made easier in some instances, our, our, the cover crops which we've used, and uh, in one instance with, um, for instance, uh, uh, brassica species, uh, Nemcon, which was um, going to be a mechanism for trying to reduce nematode populations in the soil. That did not take at all in that, that environment of um, where the soil had been herbicided out for so many years, so we don't exactly know why. But in most cases, though, we have had a, a pretty good strike rate with the cover crops in these herbicided soils. And, and certainly the, that uh, reduced weed competition in the early, early stages of them helps them uh, get away and become a dominant one fairly readily. I have sown cover crops into areas where there's, um, there's already been um, plant growth. Um, if, if, if plants are growing at the time of sowing, well, you haven't got much chance of these uh, medics and ryegrass, that sort of thing, really getting much of establishment at all. Um, the competition is just too great. But if you can get the seed in before the season breaks, and so what is being sown has an equal chance with, any, uh, with the seed bank that's already there, then you have a reasonable chance of getting a, a, a fairly good establishment. Um, but remembering that all these seeds are fairly small, so their energy supplies are not all that great. So um, um, compared to some of the, the, the larger seeded weed species, it, it can be a bit of a, an issue. Depends again on, on what you've got there already. But it, I'll just add, Chris, that if, you, if you're going to put natives in, you, you need to put a lot more effort, I think, into into clearing that space and make, making sure there's not a seed bank because they can be so slow to germinate. Certainly, um, yeah, definitely with natives. Another topic of conversation really, but yeah, it's a lot more yeah. work for natives, but yeah. All right, um, next question. Um, does the undervine crop require any special sowing methods? Take it away, Chris. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't show you any pictures of it, but if you get onto the uh, AWRI website, we've put together a fact sheet um, on establishment of, of undervine cover crops. And uh, that will give you a bit of, bit of assistance, uh, I would hope, on, um, on what you might, on how you might go about that. Um, I've got, can you see my screen, Chris? Oh, yes. Well done. Yeah. So that, that's a, a couple of methods which we've used. Um, uh, I use a, a quad with a, a tag seeder behind it and just sow one row each side of the vines and Tom had a, a, a manual unit there which um, is, is not recommended for larger vineyards unless you have some very athletic uh, personnel that want to get a bit of exercise. Um, otherwise though the, the, you can um, modify your typical sort of John Shearer type seed, uh, mid row seeders and put an extra um, disc on the outside and, uh, and and then get the seed out. Other people have used have, uh, mixed seed in with compost for instance and use a compost spreader to, to just put a light scattering of compost out along with the seed. Um, it's preferable to have the seed covered if you can uh, to help ensure that germination. Um, certainly are varying ways of doing. If you got a if you do have a, a, a large amount of um, weeds under the vine already then um, uh, uh, cleaning that out one way or another, um, things like a line trimmer, some of those more sophisticated line trimmers, just to get that that um, that mulch away, so that you can get things established in a, a weed-free environment, is good. The other thing that you do need to be a little bit careful of too is um, is leaf drop from the vines, um, and that they can actually smother these cover crops to a degree when they're very young and, and without much energy there. So you just need to keep an eye on on that as well. But once you've got the seed bank established after the first year, and that's a critical thing, let in and go through to, to set a huge amount of seed, then you've pretty much got them for life and they'll rebound each year. Okay, um, next question. Has there been work done on undivine cover crops in frost prone areas such as Coonawarra? Can they be grown effectively under vine without being mown, without increasing frost risk to vines? That perpetual question, and uh, yes, we, we really don't have that answer. I did have a trial site down in the Coonawarra. There was never a frost incident um, at the time that I, I had it there, so I really can't um, can't comment on that further. Mm -hmm. um, someone has said, you mentioned that each area in Australia should be matched with the best cover crops. What are the best cover grasses for Hunter Valley vineyards? 
<laughs> oh, it's a little bit difficult um, to come out with, a, with a, the preferred species selection for someone a thousand kilometers away. I'm not that familiar with the environment there and what, what grows best. So there we suggest that um, speaking to your local agronomist, see what pasture species grow well and, and um, what there is seed available for. Um, within mind your particular growing environment. So are you looking to, to uh, utilize a bit of extra water? Um, probably not. Um, so if it's a water living environment, well then again, you are looking for species which are going to be early flowering, setting seed early and then going, going um, into their senesce state as a mulch over the summer period. And so you need to um, have those criteria ready to provide to your agronomist or seed suppliers and say, this is what we, we want. Provide us with um, a species mix for that. And I'm, I'm happy to, to um, you know, talk with you further about that sort of thing. If you want to contact me, email or telephone or whatever, and um, we could go through it a bit further. Mm -hmm. um, another one for Chris. After experimenting, I've found mechanical weed control works well in a flat mid-row into row but where we have built up a mound under vine that includes mulch to address heat and soil depth, the mechanical apparatus pretty well destroys that investment. All your mulch goes into the mid-row, thoughts? Yes, um, not uncommon. Um, some people do seem to manage to get away with a, a Clemens type under vine um, weeder with, with a knife. Uh, working underneath the mulch and, and the disturbance is not so great. Um, uh, but yes, uh, many tools will have issues there. And so it's, um, I, I think uh, when having a look at some of the case studies, um, Prue Henschke uh, talks about uh, issues with mulch as well and how she's having to deal with some of the weeds that grow on the edge of the, the mulch um, and, and the, the tools required for that. And so, yes, I mean, as Tom noted, not the, these things, are, what we're suggesting here are not always going to work in every situation perfectly, unfortunately. Um, there's often going to be a requirement for a multiple of, of tools and, and, and uh, practices involved to, to make things work as you'd wish. And um, yeah, maybe you need more mulch and so you don't have, don't have any weed problems that you need to sort out mechanically. That's uh, another, another way of uh, looking at it. Um, at what stage is the mechanical weeding done? Is the undervine pasture allowed to grow before turning in or is undervine weeding done to keep undervine zone completely weed free? Well, I'd, I'd say that's, that's a case of choose your own adventure, really. Um, you can depends on what your approach is and what I would recommend I think it's probably what what Chris would recommend is try and build up what biomass you can in that space um, until you really need to remove any any um, competing species or it's getting too tall or something some reason that you need to clear it out and then and then use your mechanical weeder um, then um, but alternatively if you if you like kind of how things are working currently and you're just trying to find a, an alternative to using herbicide then I would, I'd probably be using the mechanical weeder at the same time that I would be spraying um, usually. So there's, there's no real wrong answer, um, but you know, there are benefits to be gained by letting some roots go into the biomass, um, by, by letting some roots go into the soil before you, you, um, you chop it all off at the head really. I think yeah, as Tom's saying there, and essentially by doing that, you are creating a, a green manure. So you're utilizing the weeds in a, as a nutrient form as well. But also depends upon what sort of um, mechanical weed you have. And some have greater capacity for handling um, more established weed growth than others. Um, things like the, the Dodge Plow and so on are, uh, are pretty aggressive and impressive at, uh, at handling a substantial amount of weed growth. Whereas maybe your under, undervine uh, knife weed and so on are not quite as good as that. And depending also again, whether it's on a mound or flat surface and, and so on. So again, it's horses for courses. Um, how would you suggest managing chemical free the undervine area in a dry farmed situation? Probably depends um, on the rainfall, I would think. So, so Tom, you've been doing work recently in the, 
the, the riverland yeah yeah absolutely but i mean obviously they're not dry farming up there they're um they're putting on an awful lot of water so it changes the the methods that you'd use a fair bit but i think if you're i mean yeah I, I, maybe i should clarify whether you mean you know completely no irrigation whatsoever and relying entirely on rainfall versus just a, a dry inland region but um yeah if, if you're dry farming i would think you know the annual species method works really well because there's not you're not providing any extra water to, to keep um to keep the undervine species growing so they will tend to senesce um and you're obviously gonna you, you probably have quite small canopies already because you're not adding much water so you, you probably won't it's a water limiting environment so you, you wouldn't want um anything that's going to dig deep and compete with your vines for the um water in the in the water table so um but you know if you're really worried about competition the mechanical weeding is a method that you could use but otherwise um if you've got reasonable winter rainfall then putting in a cover crop an annual cover crop early early in winter um maybe late autumn to to get that going get some biomass generated and then allowing that to snest in summer you know will, will work really well um our barossa site uh is irrigated but very is not not very much at all so that's that's effectively what how chris set that trial up and um it's still going along really well today with with just a little bit of water um late in summer occasionally depending on um, the, the climate that year so yeah i think that would be that would be my approach mm -hmm. um another question for you chris are you measuring soil carbon as carbon or extrapol extrapolated from an organic matter percentage figure I'll handball that one over to Tom. He's been doing the uh, the science on in more recent years. I'm retired after all. Yeah, no, we're we're just measuring we're measuring soil carbon directly um, using spectros um, what well, spectrophotometer, but we're we're getting we're getting an external lab to do that. So we're not extrapolating from biomass generated; it's purely from soil samples. Mm -hmm. uh, have you looked into any non-grass perennial species for undervine cover cropping, Chris? Um, um, no, I haven't. Um, well, no, no, that's not quite right. I mean, there has been work done. You, you saw pictures of saltbush in that presentation. Some people have suggested uh, saltbush for an undervine as well, but it is far too competitive. Um, so we uh, have to be really wary of anything that's going to provide much in the way of competition, whether it's in a you know, highly irrigated riverland type environment or or more dry land. I'm, um, I'm currently trying, trying to get to um, problematic. I'm trying to get Canedia prostrata going in the riverland currently, which is a native legume in the underlying space. Um, and so that would be really interesting to see how that goes. It's still very early days, um, and it's it's a very tricky thing to get going. Um, so it's more of a horticultural uh, experiment currently than it is, you know, a large scale um, viticultural trial. But uh, as in just the Canadian prostrata, obviously, because um, you know these native seeds they can take a long, long time to germinate. It can be very variable, and they're incredibly expensive. So, um, early days, this is kind of a you know preliminary experiment to see how those native legumes go in terms of adding nitrogen to the soil and things like that. But um, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting idea. Um, do you think there are in, any potential soil structure issues and loss of soil organic matter with continuous undervine mechanical weeding? Yes. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you when the, the, the process of, of uh, mechanical weeding exposes the, the carbon in the soil to oxidation, and uh, by doing so, you you lose carbon slowly over time. It's um, been well and truly proven. If you are, as we were talking about before, if you are green manuring though, so there's a large amount of carbon going in at the same time from biomass that's being produced, then you can negate that, that, uh, that, that effect to a fair degree. Mm -hmm. uh, have you done any research on growing a large cover crop into row, then transferring this into the undervine to suppress weeds? There's... Um, the, the, the side throwing of uh, mid row cover crops is uh, a pretty sensible way to go as a mechanism for what you, you're not, 
it's difficult to get enough material initially to provide the weed suppression in the, in the undervine area. But if, for instance, you were to spread mulch or straw or some such thing um, out to begin with, and then you were to top it up with material from the midrow by, by side throwing, um, then that is probably a reasonable way to go to, to maintain that, that mulching effect. But then you are um, exposing the midrow area to, to weed invasion as well, because you've removed um, that potential mulching material from there and uh, leaving it fairly bare. So it's a bit of a, um, there, there's gains and losses by, by doing it that way. That's, that's currently a treatment in our new trial in the Riverland is to try and, because we know generating enough biomass is going to be difficult and challenging um, in the undervine space, we're trying to generate um, in some of the treatments as much biomass in the mid row so that we can use a side throw a mower to, to try and get some of that weed suppression effect um, in that same way. So um, we'll let you know in a couple of years, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll just go with two more questions. Um, have there been any studies on the impact of snail populations with the various methods of managing the undivine area? I've got no idea actually about snail populations. Have you heard of anything, Chris? No, I can't help you on that one either, I'm afraid. Uh, we haven't noticed a boom in snail population with the, um, with the extra potential food available on the, on the vineyard floor. Um, so, but yeah. apart from that, something we should, you know, look into. Mm -hmm. question. Potentially, if they've got a, a preferred environment on the vineyard floor because it's a bit cooler, it's a bit moister, that sort of thing, maybe they won't want to migrate up the, the trunks and uh, into the canopy, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, and last question. What do you guys suggest is best practice for establishing a cover crop mid-row or undervine without previously herbicide, i.e. organic situation? Yes, um, again, um, if you're not going into a, a clean environment, it uh, can certainly compromise um, how well your cover crop might establish. Um, but once again, uh, getting it in uh, prior to germination of whatever's there. So getting it nice and early prior to, to um, the opening break will certainly help. Otherwise, you know, you, you can you know, go through the process of letting things germinate and apply some cultivation, uh, getting a weed kill, but um, yeah, you can be chasing your tail a bit that way as well. Um, so again, it depends upon what weeds you're going to be dealing with and uh, what tools you have at hand and uh, um, uh, your seeding mechanisms, what you've got available to you there. Um, making sure so that um, seeding rates are kept right up uh, to provide early competition. Um, that will all certainly help. But uh, um, yeah, get uh, that, uh, that fact sheet that we put together for, for cover cropping on, in the undervine area, and that will certainly provide you maybe a little bit more information on that as well. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much, Chris and Tom, for your thoroughly interesting presentations on non-chemical weed control. I'm sure everyone who attended today got a lot out of this session. Um, I would also like to thank the audience for joining in and taking part. And I would like to remind you that, as always, you will receive a link to view the recording of this presentation on the AWI's YouTube channel. I would also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWI Extension Project. The next AWI webinar is on the 9th of September. The AWI's Neil Scrimger will be talking about smoke testing, what do labs actually measure and new ways to speed it up. If you would like to register for this session, please visit the AWI website. Thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar. Thanks, Jess, and thanks, Robin. Thank you, Thank you all.